Hello friend, thanks for joining me for another book chat. Today let's spend some time with The Cloud of Unknowing. This book was originally written in the late 14th century. The exact date is not known. I'm going by the date of around 1370, which I saw somewhere, as well as I saw the date 1375, and I saw the date 1400. So the exact date is not known. It was written in England, um, and um, it was um, the author itself is also not known, although uh, it's known to have he's known to have been a uh, a monk because the contemplative practice of a monk is described in this book. I'm going to go into that in a little more details later on, but uh, the contemplative life is actually described here. This is a book of spiritual practice, and, you know, I read this edition from 1912 that had an introduction by Evelyn Underhill. I uh, thought when I purchased this electronic edition, I thought I was getting a modern translation, but in fact, I was getting a a text that was based on a 15th century text that's in the British Library. So it has this 14th century English uh, in it that is, uh, it was a little bit daunting at first, and I actually thought about giving up on it and going and trying to find a more modern English translation of it. But I decided just to stick with this one because it wound up being kind of fun. The language, once I got used to it, it wound up being kind of fun to read it in that format. And you'll see some examples of the language a little later on in this chat. But I decided to read this because of The Secret Teachers of the Western World by Gary Lockman, which I read a while back and chatted on my channel. I will link to that chat in the details below. But in that book, it describes the fact that in the, in the United States, in the West in general, um, when we think over the last century or so, when we think of spiritual development and practice, we tend to think of the Eastern tradition. But as Gary Lockman illustrated in The Secret Teachers of the Western World, there is a Western tradition as well, a, a tradition that's specific to the West. And the wisdom in this tradition is often hidden symbolically or metaphorically, allegorically, within religion like Christianity in the case of this book. So it's, it's uh, but let's looking at the Christian sort of framework symbolically or metaphorically instead of literally as it's most often interpreted. And, you know, this tradition also, this sort of hidden, hidden in plain sight tradition also exists in Judaism, Islam, as well as pagan, the, the pagan religions and the secular philosophies of the West in some cases. So to me, that was just really interesting. I just find that really fascinating. And it turns out that, you know, the cloud of unknowing is one of the secret teachers of the Western world. You know, this cloud of unknowing, we're going to get into what that means here in a little bit, but, um, you know, when we think, just the, the main, one of the main themes that I took away from this book was when we think about the soul, you know, our soul, um, we think that the, something that we're doing to cultivate, we need to do something to cultivate our soul. The book, however, The Cloud of Unknowing actually says it's the other way around. We should let the soul cultivate us rather than us trying to cultivate the soul. And there's a quote here that really illustrates that. And the quote says, Be thou but the tree, and let it be the right. Be thou but the house, and let it be the husbandman dwelling within. So it's saying, you be the tree and let your soul be the, you know, the woodworker. You be the house and your soul is that, that person inside that cares for it. The person, the soul, your soul is actually caring for you. You're not caring for your soul or that's the way the order should be. And I thought that was just so cool. So then the book goes on to describe the four degrees of Christian men's living. And I'll just, I have a quote about that too, because I thought this sort of described as well, sort of the theme, the main sort of gist of the book. And it's ghostly friend in God. Now, we're talking about this language from the 15th century. So ghostly means spiritual in this sense, spiritual friend in God. Ghostly friend in God, thou shalt well understand that I find in my boisterous beholding four degrees and forms of Christian men's living. And they be these, common, special, singular, and perfect. So reading on in the book, common means just like your everyday living, right? You're not doing anything special. You're just going about your life. Um, 
special means um, you have become special to you. You've become unique to you, right? So you've done a sort of development where you've, you're no longer just living like a common uh, person, but you have something specific, special to you. And then singular is that state where you really become individualized. And the state of being singular, meaning thinking for yourself, that's where you can start to then reach out to the perfect, which is the perfect is, is a state of grace. Um, it's, it's a, and it's a attainable in life now. And then he goes on again to caution about being literal, talking about heaven, the non-literal idea of heaven as heaven as a state of mind rather than a place that you would physically go to. And I have a quote about this as well that I think is so cool. And it's um, the quote is, for heaven, ghostly is as nigh down as up, and up as down, behind as before, before as behind, on one side as other, insomuch that who so had a true desire for to be at heaven, then that same time he were in heaven ghostly or spiritually. For the high and the next way thither is run by desires and not by paces of feet. So the high, for the high and the next way thither is run by desire. So if you want to go to heaven, you can do so right now, or you can do so with practice. You can attain this sort of connection to the divine, which ultimately that's what heaven is. Now to do that, you have to pierce the quote, cloud of unknowing. And so, uh, you know, there's a quote about this too, this divine, this cloud of unknowing, there's a darkness that separates us not our, us uh, consciously from the divine, and that is what the cloud of unknowing is. But you have to reach through that darkness or reach through that cloud in order to obtain the divine. And the quote, there's a quote about this as well that says, For when I say darkness, I mean a lacking of knowing, as all that thing that thou knowest not, or else that thou hast forgotten. It is dark to thee. For thou seest it not with thy ghostly eye. And for this reason it is not called a cloud of the air, but a cloud of unknowing that is betwixt thee and thy God. I just think that's so cool. And then, you know, he actually goes a little further here and, 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 and describes how to how to pierce that cloud and touch and get in contact with the divine. And it's very simple, actually. Um, and the quote is, Take thee but a little word of one syllable, for so it is better than of two. For ever the shorter it is better, it accordeth with the spirit work of the spirit. So take one little short word, one little syllable, and such a word as this, word God, or this word love, and fasten this word to thine heart, so that it never go thence for things that befall us. So you attach this, you could attach to this word love, or God is love in the Christian tradition. So love is God. So you attach this emotion of love um, or this word of love, and that's what you uh, use then becomes your energy source that drives you to, through the cloud of unknowing. The quote goes on to say, This word shall be thy shield and thy spear, whether thou ridest on peace or on war. With this word thou shalt beat on this cloud and this darkness above thee. With this word thou shalt smite down all manner of thought under the cloud of forgetting. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Insomuch that if any thought press upon thee to ask thee what thou wouldest have, answer them with no more words but with this one word. So as you go through your life, no matter what you're doing, if you address things everything that happens with love, you will pierce this cloud of unknowing, is what he's saying. And this cloud of forgetting um, is where sins go once you've repented of them. So sins are things that lead you away from love, right? Away from the state of love, the state of grace. And so sins can be repented and then forgiven in the Christian tradition. And then once they're forgiven, you have to let go of them. So you can't let them drag you down. You can't let them drag you. So you need to toss your repented sins into a cloud of forgetting so that they don't weigh you down and, and, and prevent you from attaining to the, the cloud of unknowing if that makes sense. And then there's a couple of, um, you know, there's a couple of 
you can't just do this. You, it takes practice, right? It's like spiritual practice. That's the whole purpose, really, of this book is really to illustrate the fact that um, this sort of state is achievable by anyone. And um, this is what, he, in the view of this this uh, writer, um, is the whole sort of purpose framed in Christianity, though. Um, you know, it's framed and definitely framed in the Christ, Christian language and Christian tradition. He talks about the story of Mary and Martha. Mary and Martha in the story, in the Bible, there's a story where Mary... That Jesus comes to visit, and there's these two sisters, Mary and Martha, and they're going to prepare a dinner for Jesus. And Jesus is sitting, you know, they're waiting on the dinner to get prepared. Well, Martha is very busy creating the dinner. She's cooking the dinner. She's getting the dinner ready, whereas Mary's sitting at the feet of Jesus just listening to him talk. So she's engrossed in what Jesus has to say. Mary's doing the preparations for the dinner, though. And so these illustrate, in the, uh, the, uh, according to the author, the contemplative life, which would be represented by Mary, and the active life, which is represented by Martha. And we, But we need both, right? So we live in the world. We have to eat. We have to do physical things because we're physical beings. So we have activity, but then we have this contemplative side, too, that we need to develop. So we need to both be Mary and and Martha, I think, is what he was trying to say. So um, these tools, the two main tools that he says that we need in order to um, develop our spiritual, our our spiritual lives, and to be able to access the cloud of unknowing, is humility and uh, charity. And humility is that like sin. So. The sins, remember, you need to repent of your sins and get redeemed from those so that they can fall into the, the cloud of forgetting so they don't keep holding you down. And so humility, though, is like you, if you're, if you think you're better than anyone else, that you really, you need to just, that, that's actually going to hold you back too. That's actually one of the sins, right? Because that's actually, you have your own things you need to be dealing with That's that you need to be repenting of, uh, uh, you need to know what your sins are first, right, before you can repent of them. So that re requires some reflection. Um, and then charity, though, there's a quote here that I just loved about charity that says, For all men him thinks equally kin unto him, and no man stranger. All men him thinks he be his friends, and none his foes. Insomuch that him thinks all those that pain him and do him disease in this life, they be his full and his special friends. And him thinketh that he is stirred to will them as much good as he would to the homeliest friend that he hath. That's basically, you know, the Jesus message of love your enemies, right? Um, not an easy thing to do always. Um, actually, not an easy thing to do almost always. <laughs> um, but um, it's something we should strive to do is to love, right? As we mentioned earlier, love is your weapon. It is your energy source that's going to um, connect you with the divine. And I'll just wrap up this chat with this final quote about this connection with the divine that you get whenever you can pierce that cloud of unknowing. And it says, speaking of God, speaking of the divine, then will he sometimes peradventure send out a beam of ghostly light, spiritual light, piercing this cloud of unknowing that is betwixt thee and him, and show thee some of his privity, the which man may not, or nor cannot, speak. Then shalt thou feel thine affection and flame with the fire of his love, far more than I can tell thee, or may or will at this time. So he says if you follow this practices, that eventually, you know, the divine will pierce that cloud, will send you a spiritual light that you will feel, and that feeling will be um, something that he can't describe, can't be described in words. It can only be felt and experienced, and I just think that's so cool. All right, I'm kind of out of time. I could go on about this a lot more because I just thought this was so cool um, and interesting and really kind of meaningful um, as far as a practice, very simple message of love, humility, charity, friendship, equality, you know, uh, so all good things there. But I'll leave the chat with that. Um, my next chat is going to be Dead Man Walking, a memoir by Sister Helen Prejean. Until next time, take care.